Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? There's an aspect to gaming that most of us don't give a whole lot of thought about, even though it connects us directly to the game that we're playing. This time, let's talk about the evolution of controllers. So this is a surprisingly big topic, even though it has a pretty narrow scope. Obviously, for length reasons, I can't talk about every controller ever made. That would just end up being way too long of an episode. So I'm just going to focus on the consumer home consoles that we've seen, the most popular ones. I think it makes sense to go through these chronologically. So let's start with one of the first big name consoles, that being the Atari 2600. It had a fairly simple joystick with a single button, but it was surprisingly functional given its limited controls. What I find most striking about that setup was, yes, the games for the 2600 were relatively simple, but they managed to make the most of that controller yet stay very intuitive. Uh, remember, this was at a time when game consoles and video games were very new to a lot of people, and so a controller like the one that came with the 2600 was the very first game console controller most people had ever picked up. So the fact that this inherently foreign object to a lot of people could immediately just get used without really needing much, if any, explanation, I think says quite a bit. Now, the NES took things quite a bit further, the original Nintendo Entertainment System, in that it expanded the layout and expanded the options to having a D-pad and two action buttons. It seems fairly simple, but it was a pretty dramatic change to kind of the design of playing games, especially if you look at the way games were played in arcades. It was very similar to like that Atari kind of setup where you have like a joystick and maybe a button or two. And instead of the joystick, some games had a trackball. The NES goes into a two handed kind of approach with that D pad and action buttons. Now, that second action button, of course, added functionality, but the NES controller added dedicated start and select buttons. So that meant that you just didn't have to get up off the couch and go over to the console quite as much. You didn't have to press the buttons on the console if you wanted to make more selections on the controller. Now, it also flipped the layout from that Atari joystick, which is something that took me a little while to realize, but I find kind of interesting. The joystick was meant to be right-handed, so you would hold the, the Atari joystick with your left hand and press its button with your left thumb, and then move the joystick around with your right hand. The NES controller completely flipped that around. It moved the D-pad to the left side and moved the action buttons over to the right. Now, that was a more common arrangement in Japanese arcades. And a lot of that has to do with the type of game that was played, especially in the Japanese arcades, but also the NES. Those games were generally faster paced than the ones that we saw in the U.S., and generally, since most people in the population are right-handed, what that turns into is your left hand, if you're right-handed, is better for just kind of general movements, whereas your right hand is better off for quick actions and like real precise kind of timing. So what that flip to the controller layout really did was just give you better efficiency. It made you better at playing games because you were optimizing the controller for the way that most people's brains were wired. And thinking back, maybe that kind of explains as a lefty why I suck so bad at playing video games. Anyway, we also saw the Sega Master System, another 8-bit console, and it pretty much copied the NES controller, although it didn't have separate start and select buttons. The A button, you know, the first button really kind of doubled as the start button. Now, Atari went on to experiment with some other controller designs throughout the years. The Atari 5200 had that really weird joystick with, like, the keypad and the really horrible squeezy buttons on the side. I... I have a very love-hate relationship with that console. I don't understand the whole keypad. I mean, you could get the overlays to fit over those numbers. 
to give you specific functionality, but those buttons, the quality was really horrible. They were just very rubbery and mushy and got dirty quickly. The joystick itself would often fail. It had just kind of a lifeless feel. It wasn't a terribly good controller. And the Atari 7800 tried to improve things, but it made them simpler. At the same time, it came with a fairly simple joystick or a pretty familiar looking gamepad. So that brings us into the 16-bit era. Now, there were two home consoles that really duked it out during that time period, the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive, of course, I'm sure you know that. But their controllers, when you think about it, were actually quite different. Yeah, they had the same kind of design where you held them with two hands, but the Genesis controller was more basic. It was just kind of a simple evolution from the controller of the Master System. It had a D-pad, but three action buttons instead of two, and Sega finally added a start button. But the Super NES was where things were really starting to get pushed along when it came to controller design. Along with four action buttons, it also had a pair of shoulder buttons, and this added quite a bit of extra functionality. I mean, Sega went on to release a six-button version of its controller for the Genesis, but it still lacked shoulder buttons, and only later games supported it. Whereas with the Super Nintendo, all those games since day one had the option of supporting all of those new buttons, and many of them did. That brings us into the 32 slash 64 bit era and things started really getting interesting during this time period. I'd almost be willing to say this is one of the most interesting time periods when it came to gaming in general and the controllers evolved to suit. The Sega Saturn, while the initial Saturn controllers looked really similar to those six button Genesis controllers, so they finally added a couple of shoulder buttons. Now the N64 controller by comparison was crazy and it's perhaps one of the most iconic things of that console. It had this weird kind of three handled layout and it added for the first time an analog stick. Now there were A, B and C buttons on the front but the C button was actually broken into four separate buttons almost like another D-pad. The shoulder buttons were up on top, just like with the Super NES controller, but it also added a trigger button on the back side underneath the analog stick. There was also an expansion slot, and you could stick things like memory cards or a rumble pack, or even later on a Game Boy cartridge adapter to transfer your Pokemon save data. Now, it could be argued that the controller was designed specifically for Mario 64 since that game makes such good use of the majority of its capabilities, but other games benefited from it pretty well also. As a response to the N64, Sega came out with the 3D controller for the Saturn, which added an analog stick, but I find it interesting that Despite all the trash talking Sega did in its advertising during that era, especially doing the whole Sega does what Nintendo don't tagline, this was actually the second time Sega had to update a controller due to the competition. Now, the Sony PlayStation was a brand new console at that time. Sony hadn't been involved in gaming before that and was spurred on into gaming due to a famously bad relationship with Nintendo. But by comparison, its controller offering played it safe. It had a D-pad and four action buttons and added four shoulder buttons, but there was no built-in rumble, no analog sticks, no expansion ports. Now, some of these were remedied in the so-called DualShock version that came later on, and it would end up dictating the design of really all future PlayStation controllers. So the next generation of consoles after that said hello to another competitor and goodbye to a long time one. Microsoft started getting into this as well and debuted its Xbox console with a familiar but kind of rearranged controller design. It had six action buttons, a D-pad and an expansion port 
plus two analog sticks, and its shoulder buttons were arranged this time as triggers. Now, it's kind of like they took the N64 and DualShock controllers and just kind of mashed them together. It wasn't terribly innovative on its own, but it selectively took some of the best pieces from basically the competitors' controllers and, and put them all into one. Now, the first version of that Xbox controller was nicknamed the Duke, and it was famously huge. And in response to consumers, Microsoft ended up releasing a second, smaller version that had the same functionality, but just wasn't quite as bulky. Now, compared to the N64 controller, Nintendo ended up playing it somewhat safe with its controller for the GameCube. Those four C buttons on the front turned into another analog stick, while the main analog stick got moved above the D-pad. Now, there were added on X and Y buttons to the front of the controller, but that Z trigger turned into a single shoulder button on the right side. What's interesting, though, is the L and R shoulder buttons then got turned into triggers, but they were analog, meaning that they could detect varying levels of pressure. It wasn't just a matter of off and on with those triggers on the GameCube controller. There was rumble built in, although that controller lacked the expansion port. Now, even though it was somewhat not like the most innovative in terms of controller design, it ended up becoming a bit of a fan favorite, especially for people who really got into the Super Smash Brothers franchise. And people loved the GameCube controller so much that Nintendo actually re-released it years later with an adapter for use with the Wii U when Smash Brothers arrived on that console. Now, there wasn't a whole lot to say about Sony's entry during this time period. The PlayStation 2 controller was, well, pretty much the same as the DualShock version for the PlayStation 1, I guess Sony took kind of an if it ain't broke type of mentality to its controller design at that time, which apparently worked out fine for them since the PlayStation 2 went on to become like the best selling game console of all time. Now, during this era, also the boldest manufacturer was probably Sega. The Dreamcast controller itself wasn't really that amazing, like from a control perspective in terms of its buttons and its layout, but the big thing was its expansion ports. There were two of them, and the main thing people plugged in was the VMU or visual memory unit. It was effectively a small game console in and of itself, and it had a screen and some memory storage and some very simple controls and you could store your game saves and everything on it as well. But when you docked it into the controller, it gave you a second screen. So you could get small little bits of information while you were playing your Dreamcast games. But if you took it out, it had a battery built in and you could play mini games on the go. Now, as innovative as that was, and there are definitely a lot of diehard Dreamcast fans, ultimately that console just didn't do all that well in the marketplace. Sega had been on the decline since the Saturn, and after the Dreamcast, Sega ended up giving up on producing console hardware entirely. Ever since then, game controllers really haven't changed dramatically, with a few exceptions. The PlayStation 3 controller looked, again, like the one for the PlayStation 2, the biggest difference being that it offered wireless capabilities. The Xbox 360 controller got a bit more streamlined and also offered wireless connectivity. And maybe the most interesting thing that Microsoft ever did with its controller, or any of its controllers really, was the optional chat pad accessory, which kind of gave you this little mini keyboard you could plug into the bottom of the controller to make it easier to type out messages in the games. Now, the Nintendo Wii, of course, had a very innovative setup, relying heavily on motion controls. And I'm sure you're well versed in how it works, but I think it's worth pointing out that despite 
Nintendo's kind of going all in on motion controls with that console and the great level of success Nintendo achieved with that console, largely because of those motion controls, it still couldn't give up on traditional controls completely. The Wiimote was designed so that you could turn it sideways and get a traditional, though basic, control layout. And Nintendo even went on to release a classic controller accessory that would plug into the Wiimote and had a full complement of buttons. And games like New Super Mario Bros. really benefited from that type of control scheme since motion control really was kind of an afterthought with some of those titles. And moving forward with the Nintendo lineup, even the Wii U started to move further away from motion controls and it innovated in some other kind of more mild ways like the Wii U gamepad. It basically looked like the Wii Classic controller and they had just stuck a touchscreen in the middle. Yeah, the whole thing offered motion controls, but it was a much bigger, bulkier item and you couldn't really wave it around quite as vigorously as you could say with the Wiimote. So the games tended to reflect that kind of more static type of approach to controls. Now, Nintendo even then continued to offer a separate pro controller, this time being fully wireless. You didn't have to tether it to another controller, but it offered again, a very similar kind of more traditional type of layout. Moving on, the, uh, the PS4 and the Xbox One controllers, well, frankly, they're just boring. I mean, they're pretty much the same buttons and layout as those controllers res respectively always have had. The PS4 controller added a small touchpad area that I don't think it's used a whole ton in games. And both of them added headset jacks to make in-game chat a bit more convenient, but other than that, I mean, in terms of the way you use them, they're very kind of safe and low risk designs for Sony and Microsoft. And I think that speaks a lot about the evolution of these controller designs, especially compared to the consoles that they paired with and the games that came out. I mean, they've really followed along with that advancement in gaming as we've seen the quality of games improve so have the controls and sometimes this is out of necessity i mean for example the n64's push for 3d graphics meant that an analog stick was a really important addition i mean could you imagine playing some n64 games like mario 64 with just a d-pad other times the controller was what made the console innovative but this came with mixed results, as we've seen. It worked really, really well for the Wii. I mean, motion controls is more or less what sold that console to the general public. It was a very successful product. But going with a more innovative controller type of approach didn't work out all that well for the Dreamcast or the Wii U. I think it's safe to say that Innovation in controller design is definitely slowing down. It seems like Sony and Microsoft really aren't willing to change the formula so much. I think they've just found what works for them and it's too risky for them to try something bolder, especially considering the kind of back and forth those two manufacturers have had over the years in their gaming product lineup. And even Nintendo, which generally has been a bit more innovative with controllers, still seems to be hesitating a bit. I mean, the Joy-Cons for the Nintendo Switch, they're reminiscent of the Wiimote with their whole split-handed kind of use and heavy use of motion controls. But even they can be docked to a grip accessory to give you a more traditional kind of handheld layout or plugged directly into the console itself. And Nintendo also offers a Switch specific Pro Controller too. So I think that slowdown in controller innovation really seems to kind of mirror the state of the games themselves. And we've talked about this in previous episodes where really the biggest thing that's changed for a lot of gaming has just been things like resolution and frame rate and detail, the way we on a regular basis interact with games. The, the changes from generation to generation really haven't been that great. 
Yes, there have been some kind of offshoots with technology, things like VR, but for the majority of gamers, the last two or three generations of consoles have been really more iterative than revolutionary, like they used to be in the 80s and 90s. So it makes me wonder, you know, where are things headed? Well, I think it's hard to say, but I suspect the next generation of Xbox and PlayStation consoles are just going to have kind of minor changes, at least as far as their controllers are concerned. Maybe a little bit of a tweak to the layout, maybe one or two minor features getting added in, but again, not a total rethink, nothing dramatically different. And, you know, thinking about it, maybe that's partially because we've kind of reached the ideal controller design. I mean, has anyone really complained about modern console controllers like they did when the companies were experimenting? I mean, yeah, the N64 controller is really pretty innovative when you think about it, but there are plenty of people who don't like it, who think it was just a weird layout. Same thing with a lot of the other controllers over the years. Some of them were really well received and some of them not so much as these companies tried to kind of figure out what worked. I think maybe we've finally just gotten to a point where we've reached the right amount of buttons and controls and put all of them in a sufficiently ergonomic kind of layout. We don't really need to go any further with controller design. Or maybe we're just waiting for another big innovation in gaming that'll force controllers to evolve once again. Anyway, I'm curious as to your thoughts, so be sure to leave those down in the comments below. What's your favorite game console controller? What's your least favorite console controller? Do you think one was more innovative than another? Was there something that was brought with a new controller in years past that was dropped in subsequent models that you wish they hadn't dropped. Let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments below. Also, if you're interested in audio only versions of these podcasts, I have them available for Patreon supporters. They're plain MP3 downloads, plus there's private RSS feed support. Just throw the private URL into the podcast player of your choice. These episodes usually go live a few days before they show up on YouTube over on Patreon, so it's a great way to support the channel, and I hope you consider it. Anyway, if you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching. Well, I was expecting that sucker to be like an hour long. How did I get through that one so fast?